Despite releasing 15 years ago, A Link to the Past still holds up really well today. It's one of the most popular games in the Legend of Zelda series, and almost guaranteed to be included on lists of the best video games of all time. A lot of time and effort went into crafting and polishing every aspect of this game, and the part that has always stood out to me is the twisted plane that is the Dark World, formerly known as the Golden Land and domain of the big bad of the franchise, Ganon. The Dark World is one of my favorite aspects of this game, and I've never really seen any videos dissecting it, mostly because it's difficult to search for without being bombarded by videos of musical covers or videos about a certain Marvel movie, so I thought it'd be fun to make my own. As a side note, if you've ever seen any other good videos about it, drop a link in the comments below, I'd love to take a watch. The Dark World and A Link to the Past is the first instance of any sort of alternate world or reality being introduced in the Legend of Zelda franchise, and has become a fairly common trope in the series, though usually relegated to being more of a plot device than a gameplay mechanic. A Link to the Past is where this usage of alternate worlds truly shines, however, as it is incorporated in both the story and the gameplay in equal measure. From a storytelling perspective, the Dark World's perversion of Hyrule acts as an incredible foil that demonstrates to the player that they're in a land teeming with danger that is waiting to eat them alive, before they even have to fight any of the monsters that wander the environment. In fact, to strengthen that feeling of powerlessness, the player has to enter the Dark World fairly early into the game to reach a dungeon, and without an artifact known as the Moon Pearl, Link finds himself transformed into a pink bunny, unable to defend himself or use any items outside of the Magic Mirror, which is used to travel from the Dark World back to the light. The feeling of being in over your head that this event fosters is important for the player's inevitable encounter with Aghanim, who reveals that he has been working to break the barrier between the two worlds and, upon defeat, casts Link into the Dark World. This point is where the game truly kicks into gear. Up until the Dark World comes into the mix, the player is pushed down a relatively linear path. Sure, there are plenty of secret areas and items to find, but outside of glitching, there's one specific path that has to be followed. Once you have access to the Dark World, however, a lot more options become available to you because of the design of the Light World, the Dark World, and how they interact with each other. While these two locations largely mirror each other, they aren't a one-to-one -one replication. They're each a living, breathing world that interact with each other in complex ways that aren't always apparent. There are many, many new secret areas that the player gains access to because of the way these environments are intertwined. Traversing from dark to light, and vice versa, in clever ways can grant the player access to previously unavailable areas. As a matter of fact, an exploration of this element of how A Link to the Past is designed is required to gain access to the Swamp Palace dungeon in the Dark World. Upon first entering the dungeon, you are unable to get anywhere but the Elder Selhasrela reaches out to Link telepathically to inform him about how actions taken in one world can have an impact on the other. Using this knowledge, by entering and opening the waterway that occupies the same location in the Light World, the player is then able to proceed through the Swamp Palace. The Dark World truly opens up to the player upon completion of the first dungeon there, the Palace of Darkness. After defeating the boss, the player rescues one of the seven maidens that Aghanim had sent to the Dark World, who informs the player of the location of the other six. These six maidens are all marked on the player's map, including in convenient numerical order, all well and good. As it turns out though, that isn't the only order you can approach these dungeons in. Those who are familiar enough with the game can find methods to tackle many of these dungeons before they're designated to be attempted. When you are first sent into the Dark World, much of the map is unavailable to the player. Without the item from the first dungeon, the Magic Hammer, you are only able to access this portion of the map, meaning that the Palace of Darkness must be handled first. But after that, things open up a lot. Use of the Magic Hammer opens up this section, allowing the player access to the second dungeon, the Swamp Palace. Now, normally completing the Swamp Palace awards the player with the hookshot, which means you can cross this chasm and gain access to this part of the map. During any given playthrough of Link to the Past, this might very well be the first time that a player considers sequence breaking. For those who don't know, sequence breaking is basically what it sounds like, breaking the intended sequence of gameplay. In this case, having the opportunity to attempt the fourth dungeon, Gargoyle's Domain, which doesn't require the item from the third dungeon, Skull Woods. Doing so has a few benefits, namely earlier access to the Titan's Mitt, which gives you the ability to lift heavy rocks, and use it to save the Kakariko Blacksmith and get the Master Sword upgraded into the Tempered Sword. At this point, most people first experimenting with sequence breaks would start back with Skull Woods and continue working their way through the dungeons. The true genius of the Dark World's design, however, is that this is not the only way to sequence break, far from it. As a matter of fact, after completing the first dungeon, you have almost free reign over the entire way you approach the rest of the game. Outside of the seventh dungeon, Turtle Rock, which requires several items from the previous dungeons to complete, you can tackle the remaining dungeons in almost any order. 
with the exception being the 5th and 6th dungeons, for which you need the Titan's Mitt to access the entrance of. And even though you're intended to need the Fire Rod and Hookshot to get past their entryways, there are methods around that, such as doing a Dash Slam in Misery Mire to bounce across this gap in lieu of using the Hookshot, and using the Bombos Medallion to deal fire damage to enemies that require it in the Ice Palace. The Bombos Medallion is actually far more efficient than the Fire Rod at dealing with Cold Stare, the Ice Palace's boss, as well. So how might you do this, you ask? While normal progression through the game would ask the player to obtain the hookshot to cross this gap as I mentioned earlier, you can actually gain access to the other portion of the map with just the magic hammer. In Kakariko Village, if you leave through the north of town and enter the Lost Woods, you can find a way around this large heavy rock that is blocking the other direction and gain access to this dark world portal, meaning that you don't need to complete the second dungeon at all to enter the rest. This obviously intentional bit of design rewards players who do a lot of exploring by allowing them freedom to approach the game how they wish. In my case, while I was playing through A Link to the Past again for this footage, I progressed through the dungeons as follows. The first, Palace of Darkness. The fourth, Gargoyle's Domain. The fifth, Ice Palace. The sixth, Misery Mire. The third, Skull Woods. The second, Swamp Palace. And finally through the seventh, Turtle Rock. No matter what you do, however, you can't sequence break the eighth dungeon, Ganon's Tower, as it requires you to have rescued all seven of the maidens to enter. This sort of freedom is something that hasn't really been seen in a Zelda game since, which is a bit disappointing. Sure, there are a few circumstances in later games where you can sequence break, but you're never able to achieve the same level of player agency in how the game is completed as you are in the mid-game of Link to the Past, nor do they feel as intentional as the Dark World Portal outside of Kakariko Village. The rest of the Legend of Zelda series isn't any lesser for it though, there's just a special bit of magic in a game designed as a sandbox that opens all of its secrets for those who explore every nook and cranny. A Link to the Past's Dark World is an intricate clockwork of level design, whose secrets require the player to think in unconventional ways to fully navigate. A complex mirror with distortions that allow travel to areas that one might initially think inaccessible. It's a feat of game design that hadn't been attempted on such a scale prior to its release, and to an extent, since, and is a big part of why many people consider A Link to the Past to be the best The Legend of Zelda title to date, and amongst the best video games of all time. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please give the like button a click or the dislike button if you didn't. And let me know what you thought in the comments section down below. If you'd like to see more of my videos, then be sure to subscribe and sharing my videos is always appreciated. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you next time.